Well, economist Jörg Rochol and the European School of Management and Technology have teamed up with 28 other international schools for economics to protest against protectionism. Mr. Rochol says education is the key. Jörg, what do you mean by that exactly? Education is the key um, because it allows us to see how globally connected the world is, uh, how important it is also to find global solutions for the challenges we currently face, and how important it is for researchers, for students, but also obviously for businessmen to travel abroad, to be abroad and to get connected. So what's the plan? The plan is uh, to make a very clear statement that we are concerned about what is currently happening um, and to make a very clear statement uh, for the fact that globalization has played a very important role and will uh, continue to play a very important role so that uh, also this part has to be uh, tackled, it has to be followed uh, with passion and we can't allow to go back to nationalism. Who is your message aimed at though? Because I personally don't think Trump is going to listen. Maybe, um, but at the same time, uh, we observe um, statements coming from uh, us. This means this Global Network for Advanced Management, uh, which ESMT is a part of. Um, and at the same time, we see statements uh, in a similar way from coming from leading US universities, um, universities around the world. And the more uh, pressure, the more of these statements are issued, the more difficult it will be to not listen. And it's obviously not just German-Iranian students or entrepreneurs. Uh, involved here. I've, I've spoken to many Americans who, who are up in arms, not just at the fact that um, others are being left out of the equation. They're not sure if their projects are going to go ahead that would have got the okay under Obama, but under Trump. They think, no chance. Should I even bother trying? Yes, absolutely. And I think this is what uh, what we observe, that the concern is not only with, so to say, the foreign uh, institutions like a German, uh, German institution, it is really with the US institutions uh, that fear that what actually has been a real advantage, a great advantage for the US to be so open for researchers, students uh, from all over the world, now not to be an advantage anymore. When it comes to strategizing and working out how to get this message across, uh, what, what are your chances on social media? Because Trump really likes to rule the roost in that case. He's got, what, 25 million followers? And, and it's not stopping activists, of course, from, from trying something themselves and playing the same game. If you check out the hashtag, for example, Adios McDonald's or Kentucky Fried Chicken, in North America, Mexicans staff those stores to a great extent. And here they're being asked to totally boycott American goods. There's also an American initiative called Grab Your Wallet urging a boycott of stores that stock Ivanka and Donald Trump products. How effective are these sorts of measures in this day and age of social media? Well, I can understand that there are um, certain protests and, and also these boycotts are initiate, initiated. I don't believe that they will really make um, a huge impact. Um, I rather believe in uh, what actually is the strength of uh, Western democracies, as we can see for courts uh, and the legal rights that are out there and they, that are protected by courts. And in that sense, also our statement is meant to actually influence uh, this debate and to make sure also to those who are affected mm -hmm. uh, by, these, uh, by this legislation that uh, we we are on their side. Jörg, back to you in a moment. First, let's just look at what could become a very bumpy ride if the billionaire businessman in the Oval Office puts the automobile industry into reverse. It's highly globalized and little understood by Donald Trump. He's targeted German car makers, accusing them of unfair trade practices. But depending on the model, your Mercedes Benz could have been built in Alabama, whereas Germans love their Opals, a manufacturer owned by General Motors. How American are American cars? The three most popular vehicles in the U.S. are pickup trucks made by Ford, Chrysler, and General Motors. America first, you might think. But these three models are on average only 55% American. 55% of what's called their added value comes from the U.S. The rest from abroad. All three models are assembled in the U.S., but many parts that require elaborate production, like engines, are often imported from other countries. In GM's case, from Mexico. In Chrysler's case, from Italy. Chrysler also gets its transmissions from Italy. The U.S. car maker has belonged to Fiat since 2014. The wiring assemblies for all three models are also manufactured outside the U.S. For each truck, kilometers of cables are processed by hand. Work like that is only done in low-wage countries. 
and Germany also provides components for the pickups. America's best-selling model, the Ford F-150, has a ladder frame made of steel made by a German company. Apart from that, the body of the F-150 is made of aluminum, high-tech aluminum that Ford developed in collaboration with German research labs. And the mechanism for adjusting the F-150's front seats comes from a French supplier that manufactures in Mexico and China. The proportion of American added value is falling. The three pickups were made in USA to the tune of 69% just five years ago. But car makers are now outsourcing more and more production to suppliers all over the world. We're here with economist Jörg Rochol. Has the auto industry become vulnerable by globalizing to the extent that it has? Well, it has become vulnerable to the political attacks by uh, the current U.S. administration. At the same time, it has to be uh, understood very uh, differentiatedly what actually is happening. Um, in fact, uh, German car manufacturers are producing a lot in the United States, are in, in fact actually even exporting from the United States, mm -hmm. while at the same time U.S. car manufacturers are also active in Germany and uh, actually also taking a significant market share here. Now, Donald Trump has a simple uh, perspective of how economies should work. To, to play devil's advocate here, doesn't it make sense to produce one thing in the one place and sell it there? Well, there's certainly um, an advantage of uh, producing at one place if you, for example, think of economies of scale, economies of scope. But at the same time, um, this has, been, uh, has become such a global industry in which it's just uh, important to have production sites all over the world, as we can now have observed uh, production sites, for example, in the US, in Europe, in Asia, in China in particular, so that it's very clear that also you have to be very close to the customers uh, which actually, uh, who would finally buy the cars. And if Mr. Trump manages to start scaling back uh, globalization as far as the auto sector goes, for example, how, how far could he even get? Well, he certainly could try by uh, in creating tariffs and so on, uh, but at the same time, this will create reactions on the other side. So, as I mentioned, uh, US car manufacturers are strong in Germany, and it's good that they are strong in Germany, but at the same time, Europe may actually react by saying, why actually shouldn't we also impose tariffs if uh, this is done in the US as well? Yeah, so tip for tat reactions. Um, when it comes to pandering to his demands, though, the likes of other companies like Bayer, for example, who've been uh, there in um, his offices talking to him and selling up the fact that they're coming up with mergers and creating jobs, plans that were already in the pipeline, but I guess does it mean pandering to his needs and trying to sell it like he sells America and uh, all his business interests? Um, you know what I'm getting at? Yeah, I think the, uh, it, it is important to have a, a certain trade-off. At, at, at one point, it's very clear um, he's the elected president of the United States, so therefore we have to respect uh, his, his presidency. At the, on the other hand, um, I think it's also important to not uh, actually to show strengths and to believe in those uh, values, um, those criteria which actually have made the Western democracies um, so strong, and actually uh, to follow those uh, rules and really go for, for legal uh, ways if there's indeed a threat. Okay. Always follow those rules. Jörg Rochel, thank you very much for coming in today. Great to have you on the show. Thank you.